Documentary TV. These are the prisoners who are despised by the other inmates. Child molesters and rapists. If the truth be told, the people want to just put them all in a pile and just burn them. Blow them up. You know, slice them up the most heinous ways. Now Colorado has put nearly 1,400 of them into one prison, along with murderers, drug dealers, and thieves. It's a mix that breeds secrecy, suspicion, and fear. You have to remember how dangerous it is every minute of every day when you walk in here. They almost never reveal their secrets until now. I still did what I didn't want to do. I knew it was wrong and I couldn't stop myself. Welcome to Fremont State Prison. Ground zero for Colorado's sex offenders. Fremont Correctional Facility in Colorado. With nearly 1,600 inmates, it's one of the largest in the state. And new offenders arrive almost every day. We'll burn 10557. Right here. Nice first. But these are not just any inmates. Most of them are sex offenders. Hey! That's all three of them. That's it, man. 20% of Colorado's prisoners are sex offenders. And Fremont is a big part of the state's highly innovative plan to treat sex offenders and prevent them from victimizing again. But officers and staff face an uphill battle. Here, almost nobody will admit to their crimes. They are often ashamed and afraid of retribution. They know sex offenders are frequently targeted by other inmates. And in Fremont, there are hundreds of other criminals who hate being locked up with sex offenders. I mean, I wake up every morning and I'm around a lot of cats like that who's been in here. I wish I could just push a button and see what the individual's in here for. That way, you know, I can, you can know who you're messing with, you know? I just, man, it's just, it's crazy. To drug dealer Sean Brown, some crimes are simply unacceptable, like molesting a child. Yeah, that's something that's not tolerated. I mean, the public's not going to tolerate it, and we're not going to tolerate it up in here. I mean, uh, the child is the in most innocent thing in the, in the world, you know what I mean? They don't even know right from wrong when they're born or anything like that. Despite the tension, everybody is mixed together throughout Fremont's eight cell houses, and nearly every cell in the prison is double bunked. But inmates don't know what the prisoners around them have done or are capable of doing. So secrecy and suspicion rule. Okay, memo. Memo. Got your phone. This is cell house one. Officers are placing a recent arrival, inmate Matthew Memo, in a new cell. Stop by the office, I'll get you some shrink work. He was transferred in from another Colorado pen. So, uh, you know, your safety is paramount to us, so we'll keep an eye on you. Now he has to share an eight by six space with a man who might be a potential threat. He'd rather be alone. It's just good to be alone, you know? I don't really, I'm not into the whole prison drama scene, and I just, I don't know, I want to kick back and do my time peacefully and, and not have any problems, you know? Memo refuses to discuss his own crime. I'm already stereotyped. I, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm already considered not a, not a good person, so, uh, so, yeah, this prison is heavily stereotyped. In, in even other facilities, you know. At 27, Memel's been in and out of Colorado prisons over the last six years for drugs and other offenses. People think that I'm like some kind of gang member. Like I'm always getting asked if I'm a gang member and because of my tattoos and they don't just kind of understand that I'm just somebody that likes tattoos, you know. It's a Celtic knot upside down cross. The tattoos may make Memel look tough, but Fremont unnerves him. And behind my ears right here where the eyeballs are. It's a world of predators where no one can be trusted. And Memo thinks he's in danger. It's up to Fremont's officers to keep prisoners like Memo and hundreds of others in line and out of trouble. 
It's 345 in cell house 8. With 247 inmates, it's one of the biggest of the eight blocks, and dozens of prisoners are returning from work detail. Officer McLean makes sure that everybody gets to their cells without taking any detours. All inmates can cause trouble, but sex offenders need special attention. They're masters at predation, and being behind bars doesn't stop them from targeting one another for personal gain. They're manipulators, and they're all pleasers. Sex offenders are a lot more manipulative than other offenders can be. That's how most of the time they set up their crimes. They, they stalk somebody, that's manipulation. They follow a child to get a child to follow them off, that's manipulation. It's time for afternoon count, making sure every inmate is where they should be. Let's go, gentlemen. Officer McLean is only one of six staff in this cell house, many of them women, to handle 247 dangerous men. It makes things a little more difficult, exactly, because there are only six of us. And there's a lot of them. We're definitely outnumbered. If one of them wanted to create a problem, or if several of them together wanted to get something going, so to speak, it would be an issue. Elsewhere in the cell block, Sergeant Fustini makes sure that all the inmates are exactly where they should be. Given the chance, aggressive convicts victimize weaker inmates, sometimes forcing them to pay rent to live in their cells. Unfortunately, yes, there is a rent system here in prison where um, your predators do charge um, some of the weaker inmates rent to stay in the to stay in their cell. Otherwise, they basically force them to check in or move or to do something, or they can get um, violated or they can get um, beaten up, or there's other things that they will do to these inmates. Inmates have a strict hierarchy for sex offenders, with rapists at the top and the men who have molested small children at the bottom. They're known as chomos in jailhouse slang. Even in Fremont, there's nothing lower. When a sex offender comes in and they are a, um, a child molester, it is gonna be a lot more difficult. So they're gonna be the first ones that your other inmates try to um, come out and victimize. The instant they step into the cell house, the other inmates are looking at them, sizing them up, trying to determine what they're in here for, if they're going to be an easy mark, an easy victim, and see what they can get from that inmate. Yet one inmate on Fustini's cell block is unusually open about committing a sex crime. Inmate Mendoza pretty much stays to himself, even though he might not be the most muscular or the youngest or the biggest guy around. They know him, he's established himself. So if he stays to himself, stays out of the mix, and he doesn't cause trouble for other inmates, they'll pretty much leave him alone. I guess based on his therapy and just the way he handles himself and, and just the person that he is, he does seem to be pretty confident about himself. Inmate Randall Mendoza was convicted of sexual assault and received a 16-year sentence. The victim of Mendoza's sex crime was a 12-year-old girl. She was the daughter of the woman he lived with, who was seriously ill at the time. And over the next two and a half years or so, it really got bad. And during that time, her, my stepdaughter, her daughter, I kind of allowed her to become my partner as far as helping around the house, because I was working seven days a week, 12 hours a day, and doing the cleaning and the cooking. And, and during that time, I ended up sexually assaulting her. I knew it was wrong, um, but it's like I didn't want to do anything, but what made me dangerous at the time is I still did what I didn't want to do. Even, I, mean, it, I knew it was wrong and I couldn't stop myself. I was just so full of you know, anger and stress and pushed to the end and I wasn't thinking. It was total, uh, I, I, I was, I'm responsible for what I did because I allowed myself to get in that position. Mendoza only has one year left on his sentence, but he knows his crime will hang over him for the rest of his life. Sex offenders are singled out because they picked on the most innocent people there is. Their crime is the most heinous. My crime is heinous. Even though I wasn't a two-year-old, but people look at that they look at the age of the victim. They look what actually happened, what 
type of contact there was. Uh, if you if you enjoyed it, or I mean, if you brag about it, how you walk about it. But for the most part, sex offenders they they just get off on victim victimizing people that um, can't fight back. Mendoza says he's speaking out so people won't stereotype all sex offenders, but it puts him at risk. People in here really care about. They might be convicts or inmates or offenders, but they all have children. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous about what I'm taking the time of telling you about, but I feel there's a, a reason for it for me to educate people. But telling the truth sometimes comes at a price, and Randall Mendoza may have to pay. Fremont Correctional Facility incarcerates nearly 1,400 sex offenders, along with a couple of hundred murderers, drug dealers, and thieves, all men. Yet many of the officers on the floor are women. It can make for a tense mix. Some of them just absolutely can't stand women. For them, we are the absolute bottom of the food chain. You're female, you aren't worth anything. Sex offenders are the ones that pretty much will prey on staff and other offenders alike. They have 24-7 to watch us. They have nothing else to do but find the chinks in our personalities, the chinks in our procedures, the chinks in our policies, and the chinks in how we do our security rounds. After 11 years on the job, Sergeant Fustini follows certain rules to stay safe. Now you're making up things. You're not even looking at me as you're telling those lies. She never gets friendly. Yeah, that's what I thought. Never reveals anything personal and always keeps conversation to a minimum. Being a female in the department, you need to make sure and keep that professional distance at all times. We basically have that two sentence rule. It's a basic, hi, how are you? It's a simple little exchange and then it's discuss the issue, resolve the issue and move on. And being a female, you, you really need to keep that distance. Because um, once again, these inmates are sex offenders. Going to try to manipulate you, right in front of you. A lot of times, people ask us if we're scared. Yeah, we're scared. But you just it, use it to your advantage. Keep your senses sharp. Listen when you get that little prickly feeling on the back of your neck. Listen when you feel like something's wrong. Something probably is. McLean worries less about the openly hostile inmates than the secretive ones. It's the ones that you didn't spot and the ones that you can't spot. Those are the ones that are definitely a threat to your safety. And those are the ones that probably really need to be in here because they're going to be a threat to somebody else's safety too on the outside. Ninety-five percent of these men will eventually be released. To keep the public safe, Colorado now requires treatment for nearly all sex offenders before they go free. It can last years. Treatment starts here in Fremont's Mental Health Building with a program called Phase One. The goal is to get sex offenders to acknowledge their crimes and take the first steps toward changing their destructive behavior. Social worker and head therapist McGill leads a group of sex offenders through an intensive group therapy that lasts two hours a day, four days a week, for six months. Few outsiders ever get to hear these men talk openly about themselves. For McGill and the other therapists, today's goal is to help these rapists and child molesters understand how their actions hurt their victims. The therapists call it learning victim empathy. Your family members, yourself, other people, the family members of the victim and everything, you now realize that, that impact now. I don't deal with emotional pain very well. And to know that I've caused somebody emotional pain, or let alone physical pain maybe, I can say, you know, I don't, you know, that, that wasn't good. I don't, I don't want to do that again. So I make the necessary steps to where that doesn't happen anymore. By? By, um, I have to distract myself. I do it on a regular basis. Therapist McGill wants these men to learn to take responsibility for their crimes. There's a lot of shame involved. A lot of secretness involved and they what you just saw in the group is a big change for them because they've led secret lives they, if anybody knew this they wouldn't like me so there's a lot of that stuff so it's, it's it's a process to get them to open up and talk there's even more at stake for the inmates they're at risk the moment they enter the prison's mental health building for their sessions when you walk into mental health and do classes and walk out with a certain color folder 
It's all up. Everything's right there in the open. They're immediately pegged as sex offenders and more. They may not like the crime and us for the crime we've committed, but in prison, they, they tend to become even more aggressive towards you if they find that you lie to them. If a prisoner has lied about his crime, he's suddenly on the spot, in a place where lying is even worse than rape or molesting children. If you lie, yeah, you're going to have a lot of problem in here. The only thing you have in here is your word. And once you blow that, you're not good for anything. The tension between sex offenders and other prisoners never goes away. You can't have you walking around uncomfortable. You know, it's, this is no different than any pen in, in the world. You know, you can get your boots smoked here, too. Inmate Sean Brown resents how easy the child molesters, or chomos, have it at Fremont, unlike at other pens. I'm telling you, when I first got here, and one of them even talked to me, I snapped, and that was in the child hall. I really had an inside rage, a war with myself to try to, and everybody's telling me, hey, you know, they call me money, say, hey, money, you got to contain that rage inside you. Otherwise, man, you're not going to make it here. They're just happy to be alive, you know, because anywhere else they'd be dead. In many prisons, Chomos must live in protective custody, apart from other inmates, to prevent them from being attacked. But at Fremont, they have safety in numbers. You know, if I was anywhere else, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be trying to make their time comfortable at all. I'd be trying to extort them, take money from them, bash them, you know, whatever. It's up to the officers on the floor to not only contain and control the inmates, Documentary TV. But to keep them safe from harm, regardless of their crimes. Like inmate Matthew Memel. Memel says he's received threats against his life. He wants to be in segregation where he's safe from all the other prisoners. But the only way to get there is to break the rules, which he did last night by flooding his cell and everything around it. I flooded the tier. And so they didn't give me a blanket that night and kind of left me in the water. And I had to trudge around in the water pretty much all night in just my boxers with no mattress, no pillow, no blankets, no hygiene. Now, the officers have a bigger problem, keeping Memo from doing something even more destructive and dangerous in the days to come. When inmates break the rules at Fremont Correctional in Colorado, they are punished. Anything from loss of privileges to a stay in segregation. Matthew Memel intentionally flooded his cell and much of the tear. Now he faces a hearing and time in the hole, which is just what he's hoping for. Sergeant Hache is in charge of presenting the case against Memel. 46 a.m. Upon entering the pod in the top tier, Officer Aragon noticed that large amounts of water were coming out of the cell, 5B3, which is assigned to offender Matthew Memel, 116461. There was water all over the top tier, extending to cells 5B1 to 5B5. All right, Memel, you may now make a statement regarding your plea, present evidence to give testimony. Uh, guilty. That's it. All right, you know, <laughs> nothing else? <laughs> huh? Nothing else? No, nothing else. The element of the charge has been met, so I did find you guilty. So the sanctions I'm going to impose are 20 days punitive seg starting today. This includes case number 090237. All right. No worries. Stay out of trouble. <laughs> I, think I think I told you that last week. Yeah, I think you did too. Sergeant Hache knows Memel is playing the system to get exactly what he wants. So it seems like he's trying to pick and choose kind of the rules that he breaks so that it doesn't affect him too much in the long term. It seems like he just wants to be in segregation where he's left alone and that he feels safe. There is no single explanation for sex crimes. Rage, the need to control, substance abuse. One inmate is a Vietnam vet who repeatedly raped his two young daughters for years, a crime he still tries to play down. My name's Conrad. I uh, sexually assaulted two female relatives. They were 
15 and 17. Uh, I received a six year to lifetime supervision sentence. Like many sex offenders, Conrad says he was sexually abused as a child. I was uh, sexually assaulted as a child and I didn't talk about it until I came here into treatment. And I think I, like a lot of other people, keeping it a secret feeds into a lot of the myths that other people have, you know, that, that uh, uh, there's not really a lot of knowledge of what really makes up a sex offender. Conrad had a reputation behind bars as a tough guy. He's already been bounced out of Arrowhead once for intimidating another inmate. There was a uh, confrontation between myself and another peer in the community, and we have rules here. Uh, one of them is that you, you can't imply a threat or you can't make a threat. And what I said he took as, as being a threat, so I was uh, terminated, and I went to a private prison for nine months. Conrad has kept his anger under control since he's been back, but the habit of victimizing is hard to break for good. Each and every one of you is, is an individual, is an individual journey and a struggle, and so we... McCuller listens carefully to the next inmate. Don is a former suburban family man who had a successful career. Therapists have recommended him for parole. I chose to sexually exploit my 12-year-old daughter in 2001. And besides my daughter being a victim, there were four other uh, children, all females, that by sexual exploiting her, I provided pornographic materials to her, and four of her friends saw those materials as well. I attempted to peep on them two additional times. Uh, I received a sentence of six to life, and I've been in the phase two program here for two and a half years. This was a totally different world here compared to phase one in that you're living your treatment around the clock. You're living in a therapeutic community where not only are peers going to hold you accountable for your behaviors, but you're also going to help hold other peers accountable for the behavior to work on the change. McCullough and the other therapists keep a careful and skeptical eye on these offenders. There's always a risk of getting conned by the cons. They are criminals, and they are still, to some degree, carrying on the criminal lifestyle. That's why you want to enlist the whole facility, because I only see them a limited part of the day, and what the officer would see might be different than that. For instance, we might have a guy who we think is doing great in the treatment community, and when he goes over and makes a phone call in, on the phone over there, in the hallway, he's yelling and screaming and cursing at his wife. or. They might act aggressive towards their roommate and intimidating. Uh, and we just have to know that we're subject to be manipulated. The therapists must proceed with extreme caution. Why? Nobody can guarantee that Don or Mark or Conrad will not seek out more victims if they are released. In the Fremont Furniture Shop, sex offender Randall Mendoza is nearing the end of his shift. Like most of the inmates here, Mendoza works five days a week, eight hours a day. He's making desks and tables for state offices. Although they work together, Mendoza keeps a respectful distance from most of the other 95 inmates in the shop. He doesn't know what many of these guys are in for. And he's been very upfront about molesting his girlfriend's 12-year-old daughter. Some inmates don't like that. There is no comfort here. You're always aware of what's going around. You are in prison. This isn't a daycare center, even though sometimes it sounds like it with all the noise and the immaturity. There are people in here that will hurt you. You respect them, and they will respect you. These men are dangerous criminals and unpredictable in every way. Nobody knows that better than Mendoza. Even after years of spending time with them, Mendoza still can't tell predatory sex offenders apart from anybody else. You can't put a, a finger on anything because um, sex offenders are the, the most manipulative people you'll ever meet. But Mendoza says that sometimes there are telltale signs. They don't talk to the person. They talk to a certain part of the body. They are always they're watching who's around them, who's watching them watch. Their movements, their actions are guarded, and uh, but every chance they get, they take a chance down here or that, and they'll really objectify, but they try and hide the objectification. 
These are predators who are particularly good at concealing themselves in prison and out. They put themselves in a situation where they're around children. Uh, like, um, I've known guys that have actually gone to adoption agencies just to find children. Guys that ran a skateboard shop, uh, find prison or no, the uh, youth ministry. They put themselves in that position and they'll spend all their waking hours figuring out how to put somebody in a position where they can take advantage of them. Most child molesters and rapists appear to be normal, everyday people, often with good jobs and a good education. There are monsters out there. Oh, yeah. And there's more monsters on the street than there are in here. That's just the, the thing. They, I was with guys that had 100 and 200 victims in treatment programs, but they had good attorneys. They never saw a day of jail. But not all of us are the scum of the earth. But there's little reason at Fremont to trust anybody, no matter what they say. And no reason for officers to ever let down their guard. So at the end of the workday, when all inmates head back to their cell houses, they get a thorough pat down from officers. A tool, a screw, even a shard of metal can be a dangerous weapon. To prevent violence at Fremont, officers like McLean conduct frequent raids on inmate cells. They're known as shakedowns. No, okay. We're gonna shake it down, man. Gotcha. With another officer, McLean goes over a cell with a fine tooth comb, looking for contraband and potential weapons, like razor blades. This actually is a pretty good little compartment for them to put stuff in. I found razor blades in there. They can get homemade cigarettes, drugs. That one looks clean. Inmates have 24 hours a day to find hiding places for contraband, so they become very skilled at it. Another place that they hide things in their clothing is they will open up the fly of their pants and put things there. Again, because they know sometimes female staff pat them down, or male staff may not check that area as thoroughly, they think. So, a good place to hide things. You could hide something in this center of that and never know it's there. So, moving it around, rotating it, feeling it. Yeah, that one's good. There's nothing under it. They also tape things under the foot lockers. Sometimes we use their mirrors to look under sinks and in places we can't put our hands rather than putting our hands. Good place to hide things. We can and have found weapons. Um, again, a weapon can be just a razor blade that's taken out of a disposable razor. They can put it into a handle of a plastic toothbrush, melt it in, and now you've got a really good knife. They do make knives. We do have a metal shop here. Once in a while, things get through that shouldn't. In a prison full of sex offenders, pinups seem out of place. But inmates are allowed the pictures within limits. Some of the sex offenders are not allowed to have certain types of photos or certain types of reading material. Um, the photos that you're seeing on the board, those for an offender that's even in treatment are, from what I see here, deemed appropriate. Today, the officers come up empty-handed, but shakedowns keep prisoners off balance and give staff an edge. Yet they just make angry inmates even angrier. If prisoners want to act out, there's almost nothing officers can do to stop them. And one inmate is about to break the rules big time. It's an ordinary Tuesday at Fremont. Colorado's correctional facility for sex offenders. Everything is going smoothly. Except for inmate Matthew Memel. Memel's being forcibly moved from segregation back to general population. It takes a team of six officers to do it. He's been in the hole for flooding his cell, and he didn't want to leave. Concerned that he might aggressively act out, one officer films Memel's transfer. I was kind of angry because I seen the cameras and they were videotaping me and I thought that the facility was just kind of trying to show off, you know, and uh, blowing things out of proportion, you know. I, I was willing to cuff up and, and when they told me that I was going back to population, I told them that I didn't want to go and they said that you're going to go anyways. For now, Memo will have to adjust to general population 
and a new celly. He's just biding his time, doing his drawing, planning his next move. It's a pencil stabbing through a, a girl's head with her eyeball falling out, and then there's some clouds over here kind of swirling, and I kind of just try to fill up space, I guess. You know, try to make it to where it's like a full picture. I don't know. It doesn't really have anything, like, significant to it, though. And I'm not, like, some uh, possessed killer or anything like that. But Memo is frightened and unpredictable. Sergeant Hache <laughs> worries that Memo will continue to up the ante until someone gets hurt. And if he's, you know, really fearing for his life, he's really serious about it and thinks that something is really going to happen, it could lead to him doing something more serious, like going out and assaulting a staff member, possibly, to get in there where he feels safe. Not all inmates act up. Mark, Don, and other inmates in the Phase 2 program have chosen to work with the system to change their behavior and win their parole. Mark is hoping to get out after doing 11 of 16 years for brutally raping the woman he calls his wife. But before the parole board reviews their cases, all potential candidates must undergo mandatory lie detector tests. It's to make sure they're not just conning everybody. The tests often reveal a disturbing truth. Many of these offenders have had more than one victim. In fact, they average about 10 victims each. What we know is most people have uh, been out there for 16 years before they were detected as sex offenders. And most of them have a pretty extensive history. And so we want them to be able to tell the whole thing. And uh, there's a lot of secrets that they like to hold on to. We need to know the kind of victims that they victimize, what they would be at risk to do. Uh, some offenders who look like uh, that they just sexually assault adult women may have also sexually assaulted kids, and we would need to know that. Turn your palm up, please. I'm not a pedophile. I have no children victims or any desires or deviant thoughts, and I've taken polygraphs to, you know, this has been proven, and but I understand the, the crossover, and I understand that's what's got to be done. I don't, but nonetheless, I don't like it. After your age of 18, did you ever have physical sexual contact with anybody 14 years of age or younger? No. The inmates don't always like to tell the truth, according to Sheely, the polygraph examiner. There are people that are trying to hide activities, things that have happened in the past. A lot of people fail polygraph tests because I think it's human nature to try to minimize things you've done wrong. If you did something 10 times, I think it's human nature to say you only did it once. But until we uncover everything that's happened in the past, and they tell me that they only did the thing one time, when they actually did it 10 times, they're going to show deception on test. The phase two candidates passed the polygraph, and now they're eligible for review by the parole board. 95% of Colorado sex offenders will eventually be freed. According to a nine-year study of 3,300 offenders, only one out of six will seek out new victims after undergoing extensive treatment behind bars. I've just hope that I've learned enough here to carry me through some real adversity because right now what I'm doing it, it seems it's uh, I feel some success in doing it but I'm ready to 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 deal with the reality of the world you know and, and do it for real very soon Mark and Don will find out if the state is ready to set them free after only hours back in general population Inmate Matthew Memel is desperate to get back to segregation where he feels safe. And he's going to use a razor blade to do it. Fremont Correctional. Cell block one. Just a few hours ago, inmate Matt Memel approached an officer, blood dripping from his wrists. Memel came into our office he had blood on his wrist, blood going down onto his fingertips, stripped some on the floor. And he said, well, I just cut myself and I need, I need to be seen. Memo's wound is superficial. He did just enough damage to get everybody's attention. I mean, does anybody know what they're doing when they cut their wrist? Yeah, for all I know, I could have been cutting my arm off, but 
I didn't want to go that deep, you know. Memo was put on suicide watch, but Sergeant Hache believes that his goal was not to kill himself. I've seen offenders in the past do stuff like this to avoid going back into GP, or as soon as they get in GP, they would, you know, if they're scared to be out in general population, they would cut themselves. I, don't, I didn't know what else to do at that time. I know I didn't want to kill myself, but I knew that I wanted off the yard, and that's what it came down to. Memo hasn't broken any laws, but possession of razor blades is a violation of the rules. We took a, a shaving razor, opened it up, broke it, and uh, cut his wrist with it. So we charged him with possession of dangerous contraband. Offender Memo did use an altered razor blade to slice his wrist. The element of charge has a mess, so I did find him guilty. Uh, due to the seriousness of the offense, the sanctions I'm going to impose are 30 days punitive seg. There's not much staff can do about Memo except give him exactly what he wants more seg time. Their hands are tied, unless his paranoia gets the better of him. I think as long as I don't assault a police officer or uh, get out there and, and do anything stupid like carry around a shank or, you know, something like that, then I don't think I can get any more time. So, I mean, that's my big goal, is not getting more time and just kind of trying to do what I got to do to make sure that I stay safe. Memo must watch his step. Otherwise, someday soon, he could wind up doing a lot more hard time. In the administration building nearby, David Mashad, head of the Colorado Parole Board, and his colleagues weigh the future of dozens of other offenders, including phase two inmates who believe they are ready to leave prison bars behind. When we do parole hearings, the things I think we look for with sex offenders uh, are the therapy that they've received, most generally. So from our point of view, we're looking for those offenders who have progressed to phase two and have done a really good job there, who uh, will get a recommendation, say, from the mental health uh, people who are conducting the therapy that recommend that for parole. But therapy is not the only factor. Addiction issues, the prospect of employment, and victim input all play a big part. After weighing the evidence about the phase two inmates, the board makes their decision. The parole board is not convinced inmate Mark is ready. He's now been up for parole five times without success. I was recommended and I've been doing treatment successfully, but the impact of sexual assault on the, uh, uh, the crime in society is devastating and um, I understand that there's probably some hard feelings out there, you know, and, but I'm doing all I can to change that. I mean, change myself. I just would like to be able to express to others that, uh, you know, I, I, we, we want to educate people about it so that others don't have to do go through what I've gone through or, or victimize people, you know. Yet another phase to offender.